Technology like art is a soaring exercise of the human imagination. The IP Act came into force on the 17th of October 2000. It was the result of the unilateral model laws that the United Nations recommended and all its United Nations uh, members to consider. After the enactment of the law, India became the 12th country to empower cyber laws in the world. The main goal behind the act was to provide legal recognition to the information technology based transactions and communication. With 21 years since its implementation, let us look back and examine the act and understand where it still stands strong today with the ongoing rapid advancement in the information technology sector. We have with us today Advocate Sai Sushant. He's a cyber law expert and a techno legal consultant. He is also the CEO of Sushant IT Law Associates. Thank you so much for joining here with us today, sir. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Farhan. And uh, once again, I uh, would like to thank uh, Law Essentials for this wonderful opportunity because, you know, a lot of webinars are happening. I think uh, today we are, in we are living in an age where, you know, we have developed a new kind of uh, a notion, which is called the webinaritis. So you start talking to someone on the screen of your uh, laptop or your tablet or mobile phone. And uh, I do um, uh, hope that this will soon get converted into physical seminars and then we'll overcome this uh, webinaritis very, very soon. Because I believe that uh, left, right and center, uh, uh, whatever be the profession, I think webinars are on the horizon and they've become the new de facto norm, if not already in uh, the entire world for that matter. So with that, uh, you know, once again, thank um, Law Essentials, especially Farhan, for this opportunity. And uh, it's very, very fascinating. And I would love to talk about my journey into this space. It's been nine long years. So we have some very interesting things that uh, we will be discussing today. So thank you, Farhan. Now back to you. Yes, sir, with this, I think we can uh, start over with the session. I'd like to uh, shift uh, the focus to you, sir. Sure. Thank you so much. Yes. So just uh, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So I believe that uh, the Information Technology Act is not just a sectoral legislation, but uh, from a mere sectoral legislation. I think the amendment in 2008 made it one of the most significant uh, pieces of law passed by independent India. If I were to tell you about three important and significant laws passed by independent India, I think the Constitu Constitution, the IPC, the Indian Contract Act, and definitely Information Technology Act also would be one among the five uh, top legislations passed by uh, independent India. The reason why I make this statement is it's a very omnipotent legislation because it uh, is so vast and huge that it covers almost anything and everything that is digital in nature. So I, as we talk across, I think you would also definitely agree with me. And uh, it's a very fascinating journey that happened 21 years back, where India was just part of this United Nations uh, model of uh, 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 assembly. And then it went on to a part of uh, the uh, United Nations uh, assembly, but come up with a small sectoral uh, law in order to boost up e-commerce and e-governance. In great amount of rush, the Indian parliament came up with this IT bill 1999. And finally, the IT Act 2000 got introduced in India on October 17th. I think it's 21 years back and it's a very, very fascinating uh, journey. And I'm very lucky that I'm part of this journey in the past nine plus years. So it's been a very, very interesting and yet a roller coaster ride for people like me because uh, the there's so much so that uh, the information technology act is giving up even today i think it, uh, you know with um, uh, the discussions today you'll be able to understand and appreciate the fact that this kind of legislation will actually come up in india uh, farhan can we move to the next slide But the fundamental question that comes before all of us, not just uh, as lawyers, but also as law students and also as aspiring professionals who would like to understand something about cyber law. Most of us think 
that cyber law is something which is absolutely only relating to cyber crimes i'll tell you it's a very very big mistaken notion because a lot of times i see people talking about cyber law uh, in turning for punishing cyber crimes and cyber criminals but when you look at the objective and the preamble of the act there is no definition given for cyber crime what does it mean it means that it's not a penal statute just like how we have the uh, indian penal code which absolutely talks about the penal penal provisions this is an act which is a facilitating law so as uh, we had in the introduction the main objective is to provide legal recognition to any transactions carried out by way of electronic means so india was not having any law to give a uh, boost to e-commerce and e-governance per se that was the main fundamental reason why the information technology act had come up and in addition to this a lot of cyber crimes cyber contraventions have been defined and uh, some very important pro- provisions relating to some uh, uh, compliances have been formulated in the it act and some rules and regulations have also been come up in along with this it act so we'll discuss as we go forward but just to tell you that it's something it's not just confining itself to cyber crime so that's the whole point uh, of uh, uh, me discussing this because there's a very big misconception among a lot of uh, people lot of uh, stakeholders because they think that why should we have a cyber law because cyber law is uh, only the law which is relating to cyber crimes and for which already we have the existing laws whether it's civil laws criminal laws whether it's uh, the evidence law and the other uh, laws per se but if you ask me in a nutshell i would say the uh, indian cyber law is an combination of all the laws with an e prefixed so wherever there is the mean of electronic uh, tra- transactions i think it act would still extend its hands and uh, we would bring it under its purview and ambit so let's discuss the various kinds of uh, aspects of uh, the it act to give you a more holistic view can we go to the next slide yeah now the moment you using uh computers computer systems computer resources computer uh, networks communication devices as also data and, and information in the electronic form you will now be required to have in place the requirements specified under cyber law so if you are a normal person and if you are making use of any of these seven things then lo and behold that cyber law is now going to be made applicable on you so you don't need to be a lawyer for knowing that so just try to understand and i believe that there is no profession today which is not making use of this you look at uh, the legal fraternity you look at the medical fraternity you look at uh, the manufacturing units you look at uh, the normal uh, uh, brick and mortar companies you look at e-commerce you look at the technology revolution i think anything and everything that uh, is uh, done today i think there is a definite need there is definitely a usage of your mobile phone all as also computer and data or information in the electronic format so that being so the applicability of cyber law is going to be huge and humongous so let's go to the next slide in short cyber law is the law that governs computers internet information technology cyberspace and specifically something to do with uh, these technology revolutions like mobile applications softwares uh, websites cloud and the like so we'll have a detailed discussion on all of these but just to tell you it's a set of uh, rules and regulations governing cyberspace can we go to the next slide yeah so essentially it's something that's enabling the recognition of electronic transactions so whatever we're doing today thanks to the information technology act today in this covid era i think there is almost everything that has migrated onto digital platform we have so many different uh, players who is making use of this fancy digital technology for the purpose of doing their day to day activities and also business professional social activities and one of the main things is the government today also has come up with different e governance projects and they're making use of technology for the purpose of governance so that being so i think the main fundamental agenda of the information technology act is to provide legal recognition to all such transactions can we go to the next slide yeah. 
Now, the moment I'm talking about uh, something called electronic records, I think it's a very fancy term. The reason is anything and everything that you create using a computer, using a computer network, using a computer resource, using a mobile phone becomes an electronic record. Thanks to Section 21T of the IT Act. What does it mean? It means that anything and everything that you create, your email, your uh, WhatsApp uh, conversations, your Facebook chat, uh, your LinkedIn message, your tweet, and your PowerPoint presentation, your Word document, your Excel sheet, anything probably that you create using technology becomes an electronic record. Once it's an electronic record, it gets itself amenable to the Information Technology Act. So that's the broad spectrum of uh, electronic records. And once it becomes an electronic record under the IT Act, well, it is given legal val validity, but it comes to, uh, it comes up with certain terms and conditions. What are these terms and conditions? If you have these five areas in the electronic format, the law will say, sorry, I will not recognize it. Number one, if you have a trust deed in the electronic format, it's not provided legal recognition. If you have a check other than, uh, you know, uh, 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 a negotiable instrument other than a uh, check, uh, or uh, the, uh, that also is not recognized in the electronic format. Then third, if there is a will in the electronic format, then that is also not recognized. You have a power of attorney, you have any uh, document that talks about the registration of an immobile property, that also is not recognized in the electronic format. But subject to these, I think anything and everything that's available in the digital uh, format today becomes an electronic record. And once it's an electronic record, Thanks to the Information Technology Act, specifically this section called 21T and also section four of the uh, Information Technology Act, it is provided legal recognition. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So let's all first understand how computer is defined under the IT Act, because this is a fundamental concept and this is a very, very game changing element. The reason is most of us think that computers are only merely confined to laptops or your de the desktops and the like. But however, when you understand the legal definition of a computer given under the IT Act, it's going to be a different ballgame altogether. Because the moment you have three elements, any device can now become a computer under the IT Act. If your, your, if your device has a thematical logical unit, if it has the capability to understand and follow your commands, and if it has the capacity to store or some kind of a memory, then that device is said to be your computer. So your printer, which is uh, a Wi-Fi printer, becomes a computer. Your uh, smart uh, TV becomes a computer. Your smart refrigerator becomes a computer. Your microwave oven is also a computer. And uh, last but not the least, even your washing machine, which is automatic, becomes a computer under the IT Act. So what you fundamentally have to understand is, the term the computer includes everything broadly that's basically satisfying this three point criteria. So the moment you are uh, able to satisfy these three, then that becomes a computer. Once it becomes a computer, then the applicability of uh, the IT Act becomes even more better. The reason is, apart from being just an electronic record, if the said uh, instrument becomes a computer, then there are also certain kinds of contraventions and certain kinds of crimes that are now being uh, focused upon computers and computer related offenses. So we'll discuss the, them as we go forward. But just to set the context that, you know, the uh, term computer has a very, very broad interpretation, thanks to the Information Technology Act. Can we go to the next slide? Now in 2008, when we amended the law, we kind of added something called communication devices. Now we said, hey, if any device is capable of storing, transmitting, receiving, sending any kinds of audio, video, image, or text, that becomes a communication device. So your iPad, which has the capability to uh, transmit, send, receive audio, video, image, or text is also now a communication device. Your PDA also is a communication device. Now with this broad ambit, I think what we have tried to do is, we've tried to extend the applicability of the IT Act to even the communication devices. 
so that's a very very uh, broad uh, coverage that the it act gives you so apart from computer now you also have something called communication devices let's go to the next slide bar yeah now all of us are aware that the government of india came up with this draft new information technology rules 2021 specifically called the intermediary guidelines and this digital media ethics 2021 now what i wish to tell you is that broad parameters of due diligence have been defined and certain kinds of uh, due diligence parameters have also come up by this new act there's a new concept known as a concept of uh, social media intermediaries and significant social media intermediaries well uh, we'll discuss about that as we go forward but just to tell you that uh, the it act is not just confined itself to uh, the it act 2000 or the amended act 2008 and the rules and regulations thereafter but apart from that they are also coming up with different kinds of uh, laws wherein the it act is also conjointly read along with these respective rules so we'll discuss about these rules as we go forward but just to tell you that these are also some kinds of new regulations that are now being spoken of specifically in this year 2021 can we go to the next slide bar digital payments thanks to the demonetization uh, movement i think today uh, there is everyone and ev almost uh, no one who is not using the main uh, option of digital payments you see somebody just selling a mere vegetables or fruits uh, on your uh, roadside trolleys i think even the hawkers are making use of digital payment today they have the phone pay they have something uh, where they ask you to scan and make payments and i think digital india has also promulgated digital payments so much so that the usage of these digital payment applications whether it's wallets or whether it's any kinds of these applications i think the entire uh, spectrum of making payments through cash has been taken away today everybody is now adopting the convenience of digital payments but how is this possible this is possible because all this is given legal recognition and legal validity and it's backed up by the information technology act so in the era where today we are all moving digital and we are all trying to transact our business and day to day operations digitally we are trying to make our payments digitally i think all this has happened because we have a legal recognition for the same which is provided under it act so i think that's the big uh, um, uh, broad spectrum that the it act uh, has brought on to the horizon and it will be very interesting to see how these payment uh, modes are getting evolved from time to time can we go to the next slide please uh sometime back we saw that the indian government went on to block the chinese applications including uh, tiktok uh, because it was uh, kind of affecting uh, the privacy of uh, users and the government has exercised its power specifically under section 69 of the information technology act and went on to block the same now i will call this as the india's digital strike first digital, digital strike and thanks to the information technology act once again because such provisions have got enabled because of the unlimited power that's been given upon the government to intercept monitor decrypt any kinds of communication happening across any medium subject to certain conditions number 1 in case of protection of sovereignty integrity of the country in case to protect the uh, friendly relations with the other states in case of prevention of any cognizable offence in case of protecting uh, the incitement of communal offences in sight of uh, in, 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 also in case to protect uh, public order morality and decency so uh, citing these reasons the government has now been given unlimited power to intercept monitor decrypt any kinds of communication so uh thanks to this provision now we also started to block these chinese applications can we go to the next slide pahar yes now once again apart from just banning these applications we also started to ban the cloned versions of these applications the reason here is that uh once these applications got banned they went on to launch cloned versions of these applications because they weren't interested to start generating certain amount of revenue out of these applications so i will call this as a second digital strike 
by India in this uh, context because the first digital strike is to ban these applications. The second one is to ban the clones of the said applications. Yes. Can we go to the next? Uh, now, social media has now become a new de facto norm in India. If not already, I think uh, from just becoming a uh, mere uh, a social uh, uh, connective uh, application, I think a lot of activities are being done left, right, and center today on these social media applications. Whether it be watching your opinions, publishing posts, and putting up your opinions. I think a lot of these things are now being increasingly done on social media. And when you look at the applicability of uh, the IT Act, I think it's a very, very different ballgame altogether. Because anything and everything that you create on the social media becomes electronic records, as I told you, 21T of the IT Act. And uh, apart from that, there are a lot of social media related offenses that have been committed. A lot of times, people have been uh, creating fake profiles. They've been doing identity related issues. They have been posting different kinds of obscene pictures and uh, photographs, videos upon these social medias. I think all these has now been uh, curbed under the IT Act that we have today. We have Section 67, 66, and we also have 66C, 66D of the Information Technology Act that's currently uh, trying to address these issues. But apart from that, social media is also now assuming a greater significance during this COVID era. Why? I will tell you that we are in a new phase where you know it's a different kind of an uh, world um, in, um, order that we are all looking at today. I see that as COVID-19 has transformed not just the uh, business and uh, the communication landscape, but it has brought in the introduction of new cyber legal principles. The reason is states are increasingly becoming more powerful and they're exercising more sovereignty over the citizens' rights, specifically uh, civil rights and civil liberties, specifically uh, in the context of social media per se. So we've seen, we've seen that a lot of governments have sent uh, legal notices from the CBCID department to all the people who've been making uh, certain kinds of comments uh, on the social media, affecting or making some kind of uh, uh, voicing their opinions against the government or making some kinds of posts which actually are in violation of these uh, rules and regulations. So that is the new phenomena that has uh, arrived today. And as we discuss, we have very interesting concepts of cyber sovereignty, which we also will discuss as we go forward. But I think social media uh, and the Indian cyber law becomes very, very different in the aspect of COVID-19, pre-COVID-19, post-COVID-19, and uh, you know, uh, during the COVID-19. So I think there are lots of new learnings that uh, COVID-19 has brought on the table, specifically in the light of uh, Indian cyber law. Can we go to the next slide? When you look at the corporate world, it's a different matter altogether. A corporate world handles a lot of sensitive personal and personal in, uh, data and information. So you have passwords, you have financial information, you have uh, uh, information relating to biometrics, you have uh, the uh, information relating to health and medical conditions, lots of uh, information relating to the identification of individuals like PAN card, Aadhaar card, passports, and email ID addresses and the like. In this scenario, the IT Act also went on to uh, come up with certain corporate provisions by the way of section 43A, which talks about failure to maintain reasonable security and practices, of, uh, reasonable security practices and procedures by a body corporate. So who's a body corporate? Any entity, which includes a sole proprietor, it includes an association of individuals for some professional purpose. So it also includes uh, uh, the normal uh, corporate entities and the like. So anybody who's a body corporate will now be required to exercise due diligence and have in place reasonable security practices and procedures under the IT Act and the rules and regulations made thereunder. Failing which, they get exposed to two kinds of liabilities, civil and criminal, which are now envisaged under the Information Technology Act and the rules and regulations thereafter. So it's not just for the individuals, but I think the corporate provisions of the IT Act are also now turning out to be handy 
and we have seen so many instances where companies are trying to enforce these particular corporate provisions upon uh, the competitors upon their employees for the purpose of protecting their sensitive personal information or data so this is a very interesting ball game per se can we go to the next slide please now work from home is now the new normal shall i say in india if not already most of the companies today are making use of this work from home paradigm and either they using their own devices or they are asking employees to for work from their own personal devices so this is also go opening up new vistas for uh, the uh, cyber legal uh, principles because the indian it act as i told you provides legal recognition to anything that is done electronically and any document any transaction any code or any document created or conceived uh, by the employee during this work from home period using a computer a computer system or a communication device becomes an electronic record and it's now being uh, legally valid under the it act so what does that mean it means that different kinds of norms uh, have started to emerge and the it act also has provided leverage in this direction not just that uh, companies are also not trying up to come trying to come up with uh, a lot of different parameters like they come in trying to understand the, uh, the concept of uh doing some kinds of uh, audits they're coming up with work from home policies and in more so in the light of uh, the uh, internet being uh, used by the respective employee at home for the purpose of conducting official operations is throwing up new windows of legal challenges and is opening up pandora's uh, box of legal challenges from the cyber law perspective so shall i say given this framework that we have currently i think it's broadly now being exercised and companies are trying to do that for the purpose of uh, whether it's conducting online meetings whether it's generating online reports whether it's uh, submitting of uh, submitting and evaluating of uh, work uh, uh, done by the employees electronically i think thanks to the information technology act because it's giving legal validity and legal sanctity to all these kinds of electronic communication per se can we go to the next slide yes the video conferencing has now become also the new playground for uh, a lot of companies because today i see that a lot of cyber uh, contraventions and cyber offenses are also increasingly uh, done using this video conferencing we are already seen that a famous uh, i mean uh, uh, video conferencing application got itself into a cyber attack and they absolutely released a statement that there's nothing to panic but however um, they today went on to pay a lot of damages by way of compensation for the understatement of stating that they are end to end encrypted well no names to that application it's a very very increasingly popular application you can figure it out as we discuss and you know all i can tell you is that video conferencing is also now being legally recognized thanks to the information technology act not just that the courts in india have already started to adopt the concept of virtual courts during this covid 19 and the post covid where hybrid proceedings are taking place both in physical and online formats i think all of these are also given legal recognition and legal validity under the information technology act and the rules and regulations made there under so it's a very fascinating journey because we never thought that uh, in india it would be possible for us to sit and uh, make our arguments before the honorable courts uh, across the country uh, in a virtual mode per se so i think thanks to the present technology and thanks to the enabling act which has given some kind of a legal binding to it so that uh, this goes way much more forward tomorrow because we already started to see uh, that the world is not waiting up uh, there are different kinds of uh, technologies including artificial intelligence where the courts and the judicial uh, systems across the world are making use of in estonia we had the uh, ai judge and ai courts which specifically hear out the arguments placed by the lawyers and as a result based on their uh, machine learning and other techniques were gone to deliver the judgments thereafter you still have an option to file an appeal before a human judge in case you in case you are aggrieved by the said order but it's only subject to 
small cause uh, causes and up to uh, inr 6 uh, to 7 lakh rupees but that's only going to be uh, one side of the story but on other side china has already demonstrated that ai courts and ai judges and ai judge avatars are already being displayed upon the you know, benches per se so it's a very fascinating and very different journey altogether and i talk about uh, the use of video conferencing and the legal uh, aspects thereafter not just that any misuse any mishappenings any contraventions any breaches taking place in video conferencing can also be now brought under the ambit of the information technology act and the rules and regulations made there under can we go to the next slide online education has now already begun to be in the new reality all along we thought that we could only just take up tutorials using uh, if, uh, the different kinds of applications like edureka youtube and the like but today uh, universities are now begun virtually operating we have lots of colleges schools and different uh, uh, professional colleges opening up virtual classes for all the students they are having virtual uh, examinations i think the entire concept of online education has now been uh, to be the new normal thanks to covid 19 because of which this kind of uh, technology adaptation and revolution has emerged at its peak but again once again uh, in these circumstances also information technology act is is playing a critical role because any examination any class that is conducted electronically again generates a lot of electronic records and it's also now being given legal recognition under the information technology act per se next can we go to the next slide metaverse has now become the new normal because a lot of companies ex- i mean including facebook are now trying to explore the concept of metaverse well it's a fascinating journey of augmented reality virtual reality we have the online avatars we have the online uh, virtual spaces and it's a different ball game it brings in a huge amount of legal policy regulatory aspects on the table and first of all is this kind of transactions taking place on metaverse legal what happens to the legal and legal legal uh, aspects or legal status of uh, of the transactions taking place through metaverse i think broadly speaking the information technology act is already given legal recognition because we have the uh, electronic records we have Uh, the concept uh, under the preamble which talks about giving recognition to electronic transactions so i think it's become a futuristic phenomena today and whatever we are actually whichever be the technology that we are coming up with i think broadly if you're making use of computer if you're making use of computer resources computer systems computer networks or communication devices as as also data or information in the electronic format it's now brought broadly under the ambit of the it act can we go to the next slide we already started to see the rpas to become the de facto norms for companies uh, robotic process automation automations have already become the ground reality now a lot of companies are trying to use rpas for the purpose of recruitment hr management uh, systems payroll processing and the like and now thanks to the it act again because uh, all that is done Uh, all the processes which used to happen physically are now being digitized and not just that they've been uh, automated now i think it's a very very wonderful phenomena because uh, already despite india not having dedicated legislations on these specific technologies but broadly i think information technology act is a- acting as a mother uh, legislation for all these uh, uh, technologies because you know it's giving legal validity and recognition to anything and everything that is created and generated out of these technologies per se can we go to the next slide yes now right to privacy has now been made the fundamental right of every citizen of india thanks to the latest judgment of the supreme court and the image uh, is a very hilarious one but i think the message is something that is loud and clear so i think we will have to quickly realize that uh, privacy is now not just the concept of uh, the privacy law but it's also going to be a concept of constitutional law um, 
if in case my uh, privacy is breached i can now go ahead and exercise broad jurisdiction under article 32 and article 226 of the indian constitution and go ahead and file a writ petition in the high court and the supreme court per se so i think in this context the it act will assume more significance because we already have the breach of uh, confidentiality and privacy by way of section 72 of the information technology act as also 72a added by the amendment in the 2008 year so that being so i think the concept of privacy is also now assuming a greater significance post just judgment the two kinds of privacy that we need to primarily understand as a layman one is your personal privacy the second is your data privacy i think both these have been given some kinds of uh, uh, provisions and they covered by way of section 66e and also 7272a of the information technology act per se and the rules and regulations made there under so what becomes important is personal privacy also is assuming a greater significance today can we go to the next slide please yes this is a famous game during our childhood we used to play this famous game called guess who where two parties uh, had these uh, boards as you seeing and they had pictures of different characters and by guessing the attributes of these characters we used to guess the respective character like the uh, hair color uh, like the spectacles the beard the, the mustache the color of the hair and the like so i think when you talk about privacy in this direction it's it becomes very important for understanding how important and how uh, uh, you know uh, your information can be deciphered from your own information so i think uh, this is uh, another scenario that we all need to probably look at yeah i think i lost my connection i'm back thank you uh, yeah please let's go to the next slide artificial intelligence has now largely become uh, the use case in any field per se and uh, i believe each of us who are using google have already been uh, exposed to ai per se because artificial intelligence broadly makes use of data and data sets i'm not getting into the integrities we have a lot of in depth uh, areas but uh, given this basic fact that you know nobody understands uh, too deep into technology Uh, especially from a legal perspective uh, so i just wish to tell you that uh, artificial intelligence broadly makes use of algorithms and the set algorithms make use of data and data sets and per se uh, this also gets covered itself into the ambit of it act the reason is anything and everything that's created electronically becomes an electronic record and per se is getting amenable to the it act per se so artificial intelligence is also something that's now begun to open up new vistas for legal considerations and can we go to the next slide chatbots have already been adopted by large number of organizations for the purpose of enhancing their customer experiences but just understand any communication that is created and generated out of the chatbot becomes an electronic record under section 21t of the it act so the next time you interact with a chatbot over a mobile application or over a, a website you will have, have to understand that this is also getting covered broadly under the ambit of the it act so uh, the next time you are uh, interacting with a chatbot over swiggy zomato or uh, samsung or or uh, any other applications uh, in the similar way please understand the legal nuances and understand that all these can be electronic records and can also be electronic evidence in a court of law in case of any dispute so that becomes very very different altogether and i went on to uh, articulate the various legalities surrounding chatbots and um, i've authored a book called chatbots in the law which is available on amazon and i went on to put in the different kinds of uh, thought processes that i have pertaining to chatbots and the legalities per se and also try to analyze it not just from an indian perspective but also from california's bot law perspective as also from the famous gdpr perspective so i think it's a different uh, experience altogether but broadly all these are electronic records and are getting covered under the indian cyber law per se can we go to the next slide 
the facial recognition has now become increasingly popular face is become the new passport of the present times i think uh, facial recognition also provides a lot of sensitive and personal information because it's going to identify you so it's obviously going to be personal information and uh, anything that you uh, use for the purpose of recording these facial uh, recognition uh, uh, applications for, the, for in case a company makes use of uh, of application that provides or that is used to capture the facial recognition i think we'll have to now understand that this becomes an electronic record and these applications also will have to exercise the due diligence and compliance to the in indian cyber law that is the information technology act and the rules and regulations made there under yes can we go to the next slide we also started to see that robo restaurants are now become ground reality in hyderabad chennai and different parts of the country uh, we also started to see that uh, unmanned restaurants are now become the ground reality well you see the image is not an illustrious image that is something that's really taken up and uh, all the orders have been executed via a tablet or a mobile phone that is placed on your table and any order that you generate out of the same gets passed on to the kitchen and as a result the uh, said item is placed uh, uh, an order is placed and your order is delivered now everything is made use of uh, data or information in the electronic format and becomes an electronic record under the it act so the broad applicability is that whatever be the nature whether it's robo restaurants or whether it's cloud kitchens i think they're all going to be now covered under the ambit of indian cyber law can we go to the next slide autonomous vehicles have also become the green ground reality today we see this famous car called mg gloster which portrays itself as the level 1 automate autonomous vehicle in india so uh, what becomes important is that once you make use of internet there is obviously going to be electronic records because you're going to generate a lot of electronic uh, and uh, 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 what do you say uh, information in the electronic format so once you create and generate electronic information then again you're brought under the ambit of it act forget the other laws for a minute but my focus in endeavor is to just make you understand and convey that the it act is broad enough to cover anything and everything uh, into its ambit given the small uh, sectoral legislation that it uh, was in the initial times to the present situation where it has turned out to be the omnipotent uh, legislation for digital transactions or digital technology in india so when i went on to look at these car i was fascinated to understand because being a technology lawyer i was wanting to understand how these car makes use of autonomous uh, operations well just three points uh, that i asked them number one will this will the insurance provided uh, for this autonomous vehicle cover cyber attacks and hack hacking attacks second is this particular company compliant with the indian cyber law which is because it's creating and it's storing my sensitive personal information and also personal data belonging to me and my family members per se number 3 in case there is an external attack which is beyond my control what happens to my liability thereafter so i think these are three interesting questions that autonomous uh, vehicles primarily bring on the table uh, of course we do uh, require specific addressal of these uh, guidelines because we already saw that uk has come up with some guidelines relating to autonomous vehicles but just to tell you broadly that any autonomous vehicle in india will also be governed under the it act reason three number one because it's now going to make use of computers computer systems communication devices as also data or information in the electronic format so number one that's the fact second uh, the system that is has also becomes a computer under the it act number three the fact that uh, remains is that this is also now an intermediary now we'll discuss about intermediaries as we go forward but primarily autonomous vehicles also get themselves uh, now covered under the ambit of the it act per se can we go to the next slide the internet of things has now changed the paradigm altogether now it's not just the smart televisions alone it's the smart gadgets that we are all making use of uh, the cc cameras whether it's uh, smart microwave ovens 
or smart refrigerators or uh, you know all these kinds of uh, wearable devices we have something on wearable devices also but just to tell you broadly that even an iot device like your amazon alexa google home google nest amazon dot i think all of these are also now uh, going to create and generate a lot of electronic records and they are now going to be opening up new windows of uh, legal exposures specifically to the indian cyber law per se because broadly speaking they are all also doing uh, something known as electronic contracts wherein uh, they are trying to contract with you by making you accept and agree to the terms and conditions placed in the respective devices so in that be the situation i think e contracts also have become the ground reality and different forms of electronic contracts have also now emerged as time passed by so apart from just merely having e contracts by way of click and shrink uh, where you know we just click by saying i agree shrink where certain terms and conditions were attached to a respective device maybe a cd or a dvd drive uh, and third something which is called web uh, web wrap or browse wrap or uh, you know uh, app uh, related contracts where you browse a particular website or a mobile application and you're governed by the terms and conditions and the policies per se now all this is possible because we have section 10a of the information technology act which is giving legal recognition and validity to electronic contracts can we go to the next slide yeah now wearable devices like your smart watches your fitbit your apple watches and the like google glass samsung uh, gears and the like i think very very fundamentally we'll have to understand that all these devices are going to create end of the day electronic records and apart from that they do possess a lot of sensitive personal information of you yours and mine on these devices so the said device manufacturers also would have to be exercise due diligence and compliance uh, as as uh, part of their intermediaries compliance as mandated by the information technology act and the rules and regulations made there under can we go to the next slide blockchain has already emerged uh, in india we already started to look at the government making a uh, test runs for doing some kinds of operations uh, for its applications using blockchain technology states have now increasingly come up with a block draft chain uh, draft blockchain policies wherein they are trying to examine the legal policy regulatory aspects relating to the uh, aspect of blockchain per se now what becomes very important in blockchain is it's again end of the day whatever is generated out of uh, uh, the blockchain the data the information that i'm placing on a block becomes electronic record and is given legal recognition and validity under the it act and the smart contracts that are executed through blockchain that are verified through blockchain also are given legal validity thanks to section 10a of the information technology act 2000 and 2008 and the rules and regulations made there under but we do have a challenge we'll talk about the challenges as we go pro proceed further but just to tell you that blockchain broadly is also now recognized legally under the information technology act can we go to the next slide please now cloud i don't see anybody who's not making use of cloud for the purpose of storing data i think today whatever storage of data that is happening across makes use of cloud and the moment you're putting your data on the cloud you now again covered under the it act the reason is uh, it becomes information in electronic format and it's again recognized under section 220 and section 4 of the it act per se not just that if you are a cloud uh, service provider you will now be required to exercise due diligence under the indian it act per se let's go to the next slide please e tenders now the government has now come up with the new concept of e tenders i we see a lot of uh, e tender notifications upon various portals various newspapers and the like and all this is possible because the information technology act is the fundamental reason the reason is all this is backed up by legal legislation it is given legal validity thanks to the it act per se and due to which e tenders are now been possible yes next go to the next one e auctions have also now become the ground reality in india we also started to see a lot of companies make use of uh, electronic auctions for the purpose of conducting their bidding processes and per se this is also given legal recognition under the it act and the rules and regulation thereafter 
Yes. Can we go to the next slide? We also started to see that India has come up with new draft telemedicine guidelines 2020 uh, during the COVID times where they went on to come up with certain kinds of roles, responsibilities upon telemedicine practitioners and service providers uh, where they can make use of uh, technology for the purpose of conducting audio, video, as also text-based medical consultations. And uh, let me remind you that apart from uh, compliance with the medical laws, I think emphasis has also been laid down upon the Information Technology Act and the rules and regulations made there under. So that's the broad spectrum that uh, the IT Act has. So it's not just one uh, technology, but it's I think all professions are now being broadly covered under the ambit of the IT Act per se. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, the insurance aggregators today, now uh, we see a lot of uh, aggregators who are providing different kinds of aggregation uh, services over uh, websites, mobile applications per se, specific to the insurance industry. The IRDAI came up with this concept called the Insurance Web Aggregator Regulations 2017, wherein an emphasis has also been laid upon the IT Act compliance and the rules and regulations made there under. So if you're an insurance web aggregator, apart from just getting yourself registered, and also applying for the respective certification, you will have to exercise due diligence uh, in, and compliance with the IT Act and the rules and regulations made there under. Yes, can we go to the next slide? The Clinical Establishment Act brings in the new concept uh, for all hospitals, diagnostic centers, dental clinics who are now engaged in different kinds of clinics. So if you're now uh, a dental clinic, a dental hospital, or a diagnostic center, you will have to now register your establishment under the Clinical Establishment Act. And not just that, you will be required to now maintain electronic medical records of patients. And that information, which is uh, electronically stored by you, will have to be uh, in a way where it can be retrieved at any point of time by any governmental agency. So the moment you create electronic medical records, I think you're now also getting covered your, uh, under the ambit of the IT Act and the rules and regulations made there under. Next. So startup revolution in India. We saw the Startup India, Stand Up India program, wonderful initiative of the government. Now tech startups are doing left, right, and center experiments with technology. Whatever be the technology, we see a lot of startups coming up with innovative products, services, platforms, and the like in the domain of technology. So the moment you're a tech startup, I think you're now greatly uh, obliged to get yourself complied with the IT Act and the rules and regulations made there under. So that's the broad horizon that the IT Act has on startups today. And no exception has been carved out the governments or for startups for uh, compliance to the IT Act. Can we go to the next slide? A lot of critical information infrastructure today uh, has now been stored electronically. And the moment it is stored electronically, I think in comes the uh, applicability of the IT Act on the same. We also have Section 70, which talks about protected system, where the government, by way of an official Gazette publication, can uh, declare any system, any network, as a protected system. What happens in case of this is a mere accidental access to the said information can land you in jail for a period of 10 years. So I think that's the broad horizon that the IT Act has brought on. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this, like I was talking to you about, the increased interception monitoring issues versus the privacy. That's a different phenomena altogether. Now that's bringing out different kinds of cyber legal principles uh, as we go forward. Can we go to the next slide? Electronic evidence, uh, today, if you were to ask me, if uh, on, on a rough side, if you ask me out of five legal disputes, with how many disputes involve electronic evidence component, I can tell you almost four to five uh, uh, issues uh, have the aspect of uh, electronic evidence. Now, electronic evidence, left, right, and center is used in all verticals, whether it's taxation, whether it's civil, criminal, or whether it's for the purpose of matrimonial uh, issues, 
corporate issues, anything. You name it, I think there's an electronic evidence component. And thanks to the IT Act, which went on to go ahead and bring about the uh, amendments in the Indian Evidence Act, where admissibility of electronic evidence has not been given. Now, if you produce any electronic evidence, that's considered to be a legal admissible evidence subject to the Indian Evidence Act, Section 65B per se. If you're directly producing the said evidence, if it's a primary evidence, then you would not have any issues. If it's a secondary evidence, you would not be required to have a certificate under Section 65B of the Evidence Act uh, for it to have legal admissibility. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, the concept of authenticating electronic records has now been made by way of electronic and digital signatures. Now, digital signatures, apart from electronic signatures, are also now recognized as a legal uh, tender for the purpose of authenticating any electronic records. So you affix your digital signature or an electronic signature in the email, the email becomes authenticated electronic record. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, apart from that, the new generation crimes are taking place today. And what are getting popular in the COVID times today, phishing, Thanks to the IT Act, this is also broadly covered. We have Section 66, 66C, 66D, and also Section 43, which can be used for invoking remedies, both under civil and criminal uh, remedies under the IT Act per se. So this is one popular cybercrime today that's now being hit uh, all around the corners. Can we go to the next slide, please? Ransomware is also another type of attack where ransom is asked uh, uh, in uh, cryptocurrency, specifically in, in bitcoins, and your entire device gets in the hands of attackers. To access, give you access back, they would ask you for a ransom. I think broadly, this also is covered under the present IT Act. All these are new generation cyber crimes, and I would say that the present time of uh, COVID-19 is a golden age of cyber crimes. Cyber crimes is still here to exist, and it's just coming up with new manifestations per se. Can we go to the next slide, please? And anybody who's into the concept doing uh, something called as penetration testing, I think without having a proper statement of uh, documents, without explicit permission, that still becomes an, uh, uh, an offense as well as a contravention under the IT Act. So you could be in for civil and criminal penalties under the IT Act per se. So that's the broad exposure that IT Act has. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, we had earlier the concept, uh, the hierarchy of uh, dispute resolution under the IT Act is, in case it's a civil matter, specifically amounting up to 5 crore rupees, you will have to now go and approach an adjudicating officer under uh, who's appointed under Section 46 of the said Act, who is nothing but your IT secretary of the respective states. And in case you want to appeal against the order, you have an authority which is created uh, under the IT Act, which is called the Cyber Regulatory Appellate Tribunal. And thanks to the finance bill, now it's been merged with TDSAT, which is Telecom Dispute Settlement and Appellate Tribunal per se. Now we don't have CRAT independently. Now it's merged with TDSAT. Yes, can we go to the next slide? Now Darknet is now giving up different kinds of uh, questions altogether for the Indian cyber legal jurisprudence. I think the net we access and the dark net, a lot of penetration below the net we access. We are only accessing the superficial net, but beneath that, there are lots of uh, issues that are taking place on the dark net per se. And one of the greatest factors is attribution. That still remains to be a challenge. Can we go to the next slide? I think the concept of cyber sovereignty has started to emerge where countries, have now been making are now making uh, cyber law applicable not just to the territorial boundaries but all to also to outer space seabed arctic and antarctic regions i think this is something that uh, we have as a gray area still under the present it act can we go to the next data localization also remains to be a legal challenge today we are still coming up with personal data protection bill but as of today, that also remains to be one of the greatest challenges. Can we go to the next slide? 
balkanization of the internet where countries are looking at country specific internet we already started to see china we, we saw russia having aryanet project i think you know countries have now trying to come up with their own country specific internet and if this becomes the ground reality i think it's going to become uh, a new concept uh, of uh, cyber legal jurisprudence and new norms of behavior will have to be devised in that matters per se so i think we still not prepared ourselves for this kind of revolution but i believe it has to be done as time passes by can we go to the next slide please uh we went on to go ahead and talk about cyber security in the initial it act 2000 but 2008 went on to give some clarity on what is cyber security but i would say that cyber security does not just uh, talk about you know physically protecting the device it also talks about protecting the information residing in that device under the respective definition but a lot of work needs to be done because cyber security law is emerging as a new sub discipline of the cyber law as we talk today countries have already come up with dedicated cyber security laws and it's time that india also look tries to look at this paradigm altogether can we go to the next slide please yeah said please next i think uh, the it act has come up with a nodal agency relating to cyber security which is called the certain computer emergency response team it's the nodal agency for maintaining cyber security it releases advisories from time to time and it comes up with uh, different kinds of emergency mechanisms that one has to look into while handling uh, any cyber security incidents per se so i think this is also one uh, a very interesting area that I, the it act has can we go to the next slide please yeah now reporting of cyber security breaches has been made mandated and it imposes an obligation for any intermediary so in case they don't then uh, they can now be uh, taken uh, under the uh, rule 3 uh, subsection 9 of the it rules 2011 and legal action can be taken against the said organization per se can we go to the next slide please these are the different agencies created for cyber security you have the national cyber security coordinator cyber information security division in the mha uh, national uh, you know critical information infrastructure which is nc iipc we have the indian cyber Co crime coordination center we have the different cyber agencies i think broadly these are all thanks to the it act and the rules and regulations made there under let us know uh, uh, paved way for these organizations can we go to the next slide please cyber resilience is now the new uh, aspect that uh, companies individuals as also uh, uh, you know uh, organizations uh, educational institutions and banks and other organizations are looking at uh, specifically in the light of everything and everything coming up on the digital bandwagon per se yes can we go to the next slide what ultimately forms the law will become on how you prioritize your things so i think that's the broad message but before i conclude i wish to tell you that <clears throat> two aspects are some things that are uh, pitfalls of the current it act we don't have enough amount of convictions i think that's also another gray area per se a legal challenge so that's uh, not uh, you know it's been now been 21 years since the act has come up but we still not have touched uh, not touched three digit convictions as of today not just that the huge under reporting of cyber crimes and cyber security breaches that have been done this is also a big challenge and gray area per se and apart from that uh, what becomes important is that when it comes to the concept of electronic evidence we have somebody who's called the examiner of electronic evidence appointed under section 79a of the it act but uh, more than 10 years later the government now in 2018 has notified these examiners and apart from that what are the tools used for investigation how the um, evidence uh, can be seized i think these guidelines are still not yet completely put up in the it act and the rules and regulations thereafter i think despite the fact that uh, the it act has a lot of gray areas and pitfalls but i can tell you that uh, given the applicability that it has i think we were, we were as a nation we have progressed and we are prepared for any future technology that's yet to come up whether it's quantum computing whether it's edge computing or whether it's metaverse or whether it's any other kind of technology that is coming up i think broadly the it act is now uh, giving legal recognition to the said uh, transactions 
I think a futuristic approach has been taken in that direction, but specific sectoral uh, uh, issues and uh, norms of behavior have not yet been looked into as part of our Indian cyber law. It's just a fascinating journey, but uh, I think the concept needs to still evolve as time passes by. And as I'm talking to you today, we are celebrating the 21st year of the Indian cyber law. And if I were to write a book of cyber law in India, and if the book were to comprise of 100 pages, I can only tell you we have written five or six pages, the 90 plus pages that need to still be filled in the column per se. And we go to the next slide. So evolution of life, I think, you know, the law also has to evolve in the same manner. We're currently waiting after the amendment made in 2008 per se. Of course, we have uh, new guidelines that have come up. We have the IT rules 2021, as I, I spoke to you about. But yes, new concepts called intermediaries. Yeah, before uh, we conclude, also talk, try to talk to you about intermediary. Any organization, any person who on behalf of any other person so receives, stores, or uh, um, captures any electronic record or provides any service with respect to that electronic record becomes an intermediary. So even the organizer of this webinar becomes an intermediary. Your YouTube channel becomes an intermediary. And if you are a social media influencer, you become an intermediary. If you are a company who's offering email connectivity to em uh, your employees, you become an intermediary. If you are an organization, if you are an educational institution providing electronic classrooms, you're providing uh, uh, online examinations, you become an intermediary. Your medical practitioners, you're making use of uh, computers for the purpose of storing electronic uh, records of your patients, you become an intermediary. Any website, any mobile application becomes an intermediary. So in that context, I think broadly, once you're an intermediary, you will have to exercise due diligence and exercise your compliance towards the IT Act and the rules and regulations made there under. Next. Usually the paradox of law, of law is that law evolves, modulates, and adopts. But here, when it comes to the IT Act and cyber law, we will have to evolve, we will have to modulate, we will have to adopt. So I think that's where the challenge is. Just like cutting the leg to the size of the shoe. Can we go to the next slide? This is how we usually follow law. The person sitting in front should wear a helmet. I think that culture needs to change. Can we go to the next slide? See, the acuity and acumen needs to be adopted in this direction. When you're cutting onions, you obviously shed tears. And look at these people who have adopted the concept of putting on helmet. I think this concept needs to be put in when you try to talk about IT Act. Because sensitizing yourself, sensitizing the enforcement agencies, sensitizing the lawmakers, and sensitizing each of us is going to be creating a cyber resilient society. And unless we create a cyber resilient society, we cannot create a cyber resilient nation per se. So I think that's uh, conferences, webinars like these will act as key catalysts in coming up with some kind of uh, awareness upon the legalities, especially in the direction of uh, cyber law cybercrime and cybersecurity per se. Can we go to the next slide? So what is necessary is only what is required. So given the limited amount of time, I thought I should just take you through the different kinds of advantages and the plus and uh, the negatives and the challenges that the IT Act has. But good, bad or worse, the IT Act is an omnipotent legislation. Of course, a lot of work needs to be done uh, in that direction as well. And a lot of specific uh, nuances also needs to be addressed per se. And um, given the fact that IT Act is is uh, also a significant legislation, its hands need to be extended by coming up with sectoral legislations pertaining to different technology, whether it's AI, blockchain, whether it's cryptocurrency, or whether it's metaverse, or it's any other technology for that matter. Then we go to the next slide. So with this, I conclude my session. It's been wonderful talking to all of you today. And I'm, I'm in, uh, indeed, it's been a very fascinating journey for me as a cyber lawyer. And from nine plus years, I've been practicing uh, in this area of law. Let me tell you, each day, each minute is a learning experience for me. And I only wake up early morning because uh, try to understand that in the eight hours that I've slept, the world has done something very drastic. So I keep on updating myself 
with the latest developments and technology and unlike any other area of law i think this is the only act apart from indian telegraph act which is absolutely depending itself on technology per se so that's the whole uh, broad uh, perspective that i would just like to tell you and with this i i leave uh, uh, the i go back to farhan for his concluding remarks thank you so much sir i think it was a very very intriguing session lots of uh... new learning and uh, different concepts uh, which we came across today and several uh, different interpretations of things which we have actually heard earlier uh, of course we have uh, questions uh, coming in from the audience uh, the first question um, is um, uh, recently in the case of aryan khan uh, the counsel stated that the chats that have been used as evidence by the prosecution cannot be used directly as the lingo of the current generation as it is different from the older generations uh uses do you think such statements cause gaps and issues while uh using such electronic records as evidence uh i don't think so because i i really think that whatever you do i think it, it's caution versus care how will you exercise your caution and care because no matter whether you're driving an ambassador car or whether you're driving an s class benz today or or tesla for that matter i think we need to probably uh, lay our hands upon the uh driving rules and regulations and then go forward you can't take the defense that you know i own a tesla which is automatic car so i i can cause i can do anything as i like i think that's all i can state i think the uh, rules regulations would have to be kept in mind you will have to be sensitive sensitized about the usage uh, of anything because the sad reality is that anything that you do digitally stays there forever so that's something that we as younger generation do not understand but i believe that has to be the learning phenomena as you proceed further yes sir thank you so much sir the next question being have we figured out uh, sufficient business norms and legal structures for managing and governing cryptocurrencies i think uh, this is a very new uh, concept no i don't such. think i don't think we have come up with any of these regulations per se because it's a different uh, ball game altogether cryptocurrency uh, used for legal uh, tender i think what are the used cases how legal compliances need to be put in uh, are still under discussion i think uh, we are awaiting uh, the law or uh, draft law from the uh, law makers per se i think we are not adequately prepared enough to handle the ammunition of uh, the, the legal challenges brought in by cryptocurrency thank you so much sir the finally the last question we would not be able to take in more questions uh, due to paucity of time the last question being uh, do you think our laws are progressive enough to deal with ai so that's a very good question so i i i'll say partially uh, we, we are on a we have provided some initial recognition but there's a lot more to be done in the uh, context of ai because what becomes important is legal status of ai is the fundamental area that we need to address and the rules and the responsibilities and the liabilities and the kinds of legal uh, issues whether it's jurisdictional issues or whether it's the uh, tortious issues or you know any other aspect for, for that matter needs to be looked into as a separate uh, legislation per se though countries have already started to do a lot of work i think only one country uh, that is state of illinois has come up with small piece of law on, on ai which is called the ai video conferencing act which is very specific in case you use the videos of employees for the purpose of evaluating uh, you know their uh, uh, performance and things like that which specifically makes use of ai then uh, that talks about the kinds of legal compliances that they need to adopt for example it should not be used for any other purpose other than for official purposes if the person requ requests you for deletion that has to be done within the time period of uh, uh, the stipulated time as specified so i think only these things have been done but i think far more needs to be done capacity building is something that constantly needs to be done at all levels uh, i think that will only be uh, able to create some kind of uh, uh, legal framework out of stakeholders needs to be need to meet their consultations have to be made and discussions have to be done in their direction i think these webinars and conferences will have to also start emphasizing upon these area to come up with a broad framework governing ai but i think in a, at at a very initial level i think we are now okay because it as i told you gives legal recognition to something that is done out of ai but what becomes important is a specific and important aspects relating to ai have not been uh given any kinds of address so far uh thank you so much sir with this uh, we come to the end of the session i would like to call upon maitri for a formal vote of thanks 
Am I audible? Yes, yeah. you are. Yeah. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. It was such an insightful event to be part of, and I hope everyone learned more about cyber laws of India, just as I did. On behalf of Law Essentials India, it is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion to all the people who made this event successful. First of all, I would like to thank Advocate Sai Sushan Sir, who took out valuable time off his busy schedule to share his precious knowledge with all of us. His deep understanding of the topic reflected through his words. We are grateful to have you here with us. I would then like to thank our moderator, Farhan, for taking efforts to make this event possible. And finally, this event would not have been a success with all our lovely participants. Thank you so much for joining this session and paying your treasured attention on a Sunday evening. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening ahead.